Um, today we're gonna, this is the health message, this is the health part of our service. And before we dive into the meat of the things, let us begin with prayer, and then we'll get right into it. Non the upward way, new heights, still praying at thy onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up, and I shall stand by faith on heaven, stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Father in heaven, I thank you for all that you have done for us. Your faithfulness, your goodness towards us is evident. We can see it, Lord. And we thank you for what you have done, what you have done for us, and what you are continuing to do even now as I speak. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would lay my glory in the dust, that you would put your words in my mouth, and that you would speak through me, that you would use me, that you would help me to speak the words that we need to hear so that our lives may be changed and transformed for the better. Forgive us for all our sins, and forgive me, O oh Lord, for all my sins, Heavenly Father, that I have done. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help me, Lord, to present the way how you want me to present, and to speak the things you would have me to say. In Jesus' name I pray, with thanksgiving, amen. Alrighty, the, we are, again, this is the health portion of our service. It is our custom here at BBN to have a portion dedicated for the health message. And this is um, the time right here and now for the health message. And during this health message, we are continuing in the series, Principles of Anatomy and Physiology with Biblical connections. Anatomy is the study of how the body looks. Physiology is the study of how the body works. So in this series, we are looking at how the body looks and how the body works. What is the structure and function of the human body? And the question a person may ask is why? What's all it for? Well, for at least two reasons. Number one, the Bible, according to the biblical account, we are supposed to be stewards of what? This, our body or God's body? Starts of God's body. So in order to be a good steward, to be, uh, in order to be good stewards of this temple, of this body, we must understand how it works, how it operates, so we could understand how to keep it, preserve it in proper function, or if it's in a bad state, how to bring it back up. You understand where they're coming from? And the second reason why this series is important is because all of us here, God has called each and every one of us to a special work, which is what? Proclaiming his word and also, not only proclaim it in precept, but also by example. For when Christ was on earth, he not only preached and teach, but he also healed. So God is calling each and every one of us to be medical missionaries in our own rank. And in order to be true medical missionaries, we must understand how the body works, how the body looks, so that we could be able to help the afflicted ones who are in need of our help. So this series is definitely important. Principles of Anatomy and Physiology. We are in chapter 2, chapter 2 of, of this series. If you missed chapter 1, um, I'm very sorry. Chapter 1 dealt with the introduction of, to the human body, but now we are in chapter 2. Chapter 2 is the chemical level of organization. There are six levels of organization of the human body. We have the cellular the chemical, sorry, the chemical, the cellular, the tissue, the organ, the system. No, I missed one. Cellular, sorry, chemical, cellular, tissue, organ. Which one I missing? Cellular, chemical, tissue, organ. I have to be missing one. Which one? 
system, there we go, system, and yeah, definitely the entire organism, right? Yes, thank you. So there are six, right? There are six levels of, of organization, and this one, the chemical, is the foundation, all right? In fact, we cannot understand the human body without understanding the chemical level. In fact, we can't even speak about the human body without talking about the chemical level of organization. So it's very important. Why is it important? It's important because we are made up of chemicals, number one, and number two, it's important because chemical reactions happen, countless and countless and countless chemical reactions happen in our body every single day, right? So our bodies are definitely, when we start talking about the body, we have to get into the chemical level of organization. So today, our topic for today is the elements of life. The elements of life. How many persons here ever eat bread before? You ever eat bread before? Whole, it could be whole wheat, white, whatever. You ever eat bread before? And if I ask the question, what, what are the elements that are in that bread? That's one question. Think about it. What are the elements that are in the bread? Right? The second question. When you eat that bread, of course it's going to be digested, right? Are the elements that are in the bread digested with? Sorry, are the elements that are in the bread going to be broken down? How many persons think they're going to be broken down? Some say it's going to be broken now. Oh, okay, you have some hands, right? And if it's broken now, what does, what does it change to? And what is it used for? These type of questions are important questions because when you start to talk to persons about eating a healthy life, they ask you, okay, well, what's the point? And the chemical level of organization, as we study it, even through this, this, this little talk that we're going to have, as we study, we're going to understand what, maybe not today, maybe not today, but we're going to understand what components consist of the food that we eat, what elements are in the food that we eat, and if indeed they are broken down. And what do they change to if they are broken down? So these type of questions, when you start talking about them, you automatically enter the chemical level of organization. And as you get to understand the chemical level of organization more, you'll be able to, to, to give a, a confident answer to a person who would ask you such a question. Because we eat food every day. How about if everyone ever eat beets? Beets. What elements are in the beets? Beets is not one of my favorite but I know it's good for me. But what elements are in the beets? And when you digest the beets, does the elements, are the elements broken down with the beets? What's another one? Broccoli. What elements are in broccoli? And when you eat broccoli, and you digest broccoli, are the elements that are in broccoli digested with it? Interesting question, right? Hopefully by the end of this session, you would understand and be able to give a confident answer to those questions. So let's, be, uh, a bit of a backtrack, in, two in, in section 2.1.2, .2, we dealt with what? Uh, we talk about a matter and matter, and we dealt with what is matter? And we said that matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. And we gave some examples, apples, chairs, humans, dogs, microphone. Those are examples of matter. Car, right? Matter is all around us, right? The chair you're sitting on, the podium, this, this remote, all of them are classified or considered to be matter. So when I say matter, that's what I'm talking about. The air condition, you know, the lights, all of them are considered to be matter. Now we talked about last time the states of matter. We talked about solids, liquids, and gas. Those are different, those are different states of matter. And there's, a, there's another state that we, don't, that we don't talk about. 
Um, but for now, let's just consider the, um, these three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. In the body, these three states are apparent. You say, Isaac, what do you mean? Yeah, the bones, that's solid. Your teeth, that's solid. The hair, that's solid, right? So that's one state of matter that's inside your body. Inside the body, you also have liquid. And this is just all review for those persons who are here. Inside the body, you also have liquid. Liquid in form of what? This clear, um, this is more yellowish. This is blood plasma. This is the liquid part of blood. And this is packages of blood plasma that persons donate to the hospital. So some people may need blood plasma. So here they have it available, right? And you could see it's like a clearish, yellowish type substance, but it's liquid, right? Tears, liquid, right? So in the body we have solids, bones, teeth, hair, liquid, blood plasma, tears, sweat, right? We also have what? Oxygen, right? We breathe in oxygen, and that's another state of matter. And we breathe out what? Carbon dioxide. Those are the states of matter. And then inside the presentation, coming down to the ladder end, we, 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 we talked about this thing. We talked about these building blocks. And we said that all living, living and non-living things consist of these building blocks. Anyone can remember what these building blocks are called? Okay, I know it was a while back. All right, these building blocks are called elements. All right? So everything from this podium to myself to the air conditioning, to the chairs, are made up of these building blocks called elements. Now, examples of elements. You have gold, silver. You have iron and copper and aluminum. There are different examples of elements, all right? In fact, we have more than just the ones I mentioned. You have a whole host of them, right? And this is what we call the periodic table of elements. And remember, the building blocks of life, the building blocks of the things that we see, whether we're living or non-living, are elements. Now, if you're looking at this, you say, Isaac, well, how do you read this? We, have, we see letters. We see H and LI and BE and NA and MG and K. And CA, what do they mean, right? Well, each named element is designated by a chemical symbol, one or two letters, letters of the element's name in English, Latin, or another language. So, for example, oxygen. The first letter in the word of oxygen is what? It's O. So, when we talk about the chemical symbol of oxygen, we would use O. Right? For example, another one, nitrogen. The first letter in the, in the word nitrogen is N. So when we talk about the chemical symbol of nitrogen, we would say N. Now, gold starts with G, right? But the chemical symbol of gold is not G, right? So there are different nuances. So in a different language, whether it be Latin or any other, or a different language, they take some of those letters and assign it for the chemical symbol, okay? For example, another one is aluminum, AL, right? That's, so this chemical symbol is AL, all right? So we just take the letters from the name to make the chemical symbol. All right, so that's a periodic table of elements. And there are 118 known elements and recognized elements. 92 of them, 92 of these elements are naturally occurring. The rest are synthetic or man-made in a lab, whatever the case may be. Now, more on elements. This is very important, and this will answer a question I asked you earlier. An element is defined as a pure substance that is different from the different types of matter in that it cannot be broken down or created by regular chemical processes. The next thing we need to know about elements is that 
we cannot get them our body cannot make them we have to get them from the things that we eat from the air that we breathe our body cannot manufacture elements our body could manufacture other things other compounds but not elements elements are fundamental right you cannot break them down easily um, not by regular chemical processes so when you eat that bread and in fact bread have different elements some elements that are in bread would be carbon hydrogen oxygen if you put salt in it you would have some sodium and chloride when you eat that bread and you mash it down and you swallow it, it goes in the digestive system and the hydrochloric acid starts to act, act on it the hydrochloric acid cannot break down the elements so I was like, what does it break what does it break if it cannot break down the elements well it doesn't break down the elements what does it what it does it break down the bonds see elements combine to form new compounds so when your body starts to digest it it breaks down the bonds but it cannot your body cannot break down a hydrogen element it just can't it cannot break down that sodium element it cannot it cannot break down the potassium element it cannot right in fact we need those elements to sustain life we need the calcium and we need the in fact speaking of calcium where do we get calcium from please don't say milk where do we where do we get calcium from we get calcium from kale right and broccoli and when you eat that the body doesn't digest calcium it uses calcium right it doesn't digest calcium it breaks down so you have these elements combined to form bigger molecules and it breaks them down simpler right so that the body could use those elements but it cannot break down the elements right so beets what do we get from beets iron that's why i tell you eat beets so you could get iron if your body used to digest iron then why eat the beets right no your body does not digest iron because iron is an element iron is fundamental right okay so that's a little talk on that so it cannot be broken down or and if you want to understand because i'm not going to say it inside this talk if you want to understand how really they are broken down and created the atoms sorry the elements you could talk to me after the service or something i could explain it to you but it's not a trivial thing all right it's not trivial all right so while your body can assemble many of the chemical compounds needed for life from their constituent elements it cannot make elements they must come from the environment so if you need if you if you need calcium if you need iron if you need potassium if you need sodium you must get it from the outside your body cannot manufacture it in fact when you starve your body of it for example calcium when you don't give your body enough calcium what your body starts to do it starts to take it from the bones all right because calcium is needed all right very much so so I, it's Isaac you said our body is made up of elements but what elements is our body made up of and how much of those elements is our body made up of well your body is made up of in terms of percentage mass all right in terms of the mass or the weight of your body in terms of percentage it's 65 percent oxygen you say Isaac how is our body 65 percent oxygen in terms of weight we'll be floating that's a very smart question see the oxygen that is inside your body is largely because of the water right because water is H2O hydrogen and oxygen so the oxygen that we found in huge amounts inside the body is as a result of the water that we have inside our body that is there in huge amounts you do understand that the body have like plenty water in it right um, more than half right like 65 70 percent of your body is water so if if 75 is 70 65 percent of your body is water and water is made from hydrogen atom 
sorry, hydrogen and oxygen, what elements you think you're going to have a lot inside your body? Hydrogen and oxygen, right? So 65% of the body's weight is, although the body's mass is oxygen, and that's represented here, 65%, that's more than half, right? And that's one of the elements. The next one that comes very high is carbon. Carbon is needed for a lot of stuff, right? You need carbon for hydro carbohydrates. Carbon is inside um, proteins. Carbon, a lot of carbon, 18% thereabout. Hydrogen, 10%. Nitrogen, 3%. So carbon, sorry, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and what else? Nitrogen, those four make up 96% of your body's mass. Just those four elements. So they are called the major elements. And we denote that one in red. Those four, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, those four, 96%, right? Combine it, think about it. 65 plus 18.5 plus 9.5 plus 3.2, that's, that'll give you 96.2. So about 96% of your body's mass is from those four major elements. What does that tell you? Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. They are indispensable for life. You need them for life. Without them, you will not exist. That's, that's just how the designer, God, made it. And then we have what we call the lesser elements. These seven. Calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chloride, magnesium. They are the lesser elements. And then we have trace elements. Trace elements would be boron, chromium, cobalt, copper, fluoride, and that's like less than 1%, so very small amounts. We know that some of those trace elements, we know what they're for. Other, other than, uh, some of the others, we, 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 really, we really can't pinpoint, like, what is this for as yet, all right? Zinc, oh, zinc. Zinc is important. It's a trace element, but zinc is very important. Um, and we'll get into that um, hopefully in a later discussion. All right. That brings us to the end of our, not health message, but our health, our science discussion. Now let's talk about biblical connections in the little time that I have left. We know that elements, so we said that elements are what? Building blocks. What is a block? What is a block? And my carpenters and construction men could help me with this. What is a block, right? I'm not a carpenter nor a, um, a, a builder, so I go on to the dictionary and I ask the dictionary, what is a block, right? And the dictionary defines a block as a what? A large, solid piece of hard material, material, especially a what? A rock, a stone, or wood, typically with flat surfaces on each side. So here is a block of rock. Or you could have a block of marble, or you could have a block of wood, but once it's a large, hard material, then you call it a block of something. But let's pay attention to this block of stone or this block of rock. I want us to pay attention to that. Can you tell me any biblical accounts that deals with rock? Someone said it. Any biblical accounts that deals with rock? Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 17, verse we can start at verse 1 and go on all down to verse 6. Are there any biblical accounts dealing with rock? Exodus chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. All right. And, and the Bible tells us, And all the congregation of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin, after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Ramadan, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. 
And Moses said unto them, Why chide with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? Verse 3, And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and, Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Verse 4, and Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They are almost ready to, be, to stone me. That's a good thing he did. Verse 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, Oh, and this is, this, is, this is the text. Verse 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy what? Rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, Take in thine hand and go. Don't miss verse 6. Behold, I will stand before thee, therefore upon what? Upon what? The rock in what? Herob, and thou shalt do what? Smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. Sorry. There, sorry. Behold, I, I will stand before thee, they are upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come out water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So we have this scene. The children of Israel are in desperate need of water. God has been helping them, providing miracles all through the journey. And here, they are distrustful and they are doubtful of God's leading and God's providences. And Moses said unto God, unto the people why why are you doing this hasn't god been faithful all this time and god tells moses go and smite the what rock don't forget that my question is what is the rock a symbol of what is the rock a symbol of turn with me in your bibles to first corinthians chapter 10 we're going to look at verse chapter starting verse 1 going to 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, and we're trying to figure out what does this rock represent? God doesn't do anything willy-nilly. So why do you tell him smite the rock? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not have, sorry, moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and, they, and, and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they this is it right here for they drank of that spiritual what? rock that followed them and that rock was who? Christ so here in the Bible the Bible is telling us in clear unmistakable lines that that rock was a figure, a representation of Jesus Christ. You say, Isaac, that's only one text. Let's consider other texts. And this is taken from the Spirit of Prophecy, and inside of it, you have different biblical texts that we, that we could also see that also shows us that Jesus Christ is, in a figurative sense, the rock. This is taken from Patriarchs and Prophets. It says, centuries before the advent of Christ. In other words, centuries before Christ came. Hundreds of years before Christ came. Moses pointed to him, Jesus Christ, as the what? Rock of Israel's what? Salvation. That's Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 15. The psalmist sang of him as what? My Redeemer, the rock of my strength. The rock that is higher than I and a rock of habitation the rock of my heart and the what rock of my refuge so here we see in different instances of the bible the bible refers to jesus christ as the what the rock and what a fitting description for jesus christ as the rock for what is a rock a rock is something that is stable a rock is something that can be depended on a rock is something that doesn't change and we could parallel that directly to the character of Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ can be what? Dependent upon, upon. We can what? Trust him. Because our faith is not in, in, in what? Shifting sand. But in what? The rock Christ Jesus. So what a fitting dis dis description for someone who what? Never changed. 
Jesus says, I am the Lord, I change not. The Bible says, Jesus is saying what? Yesterday, today, and forever. So when God says something, we can trust his word. And that's why God doesn't like when we doubt. Because God is saying, I don't change. You have my word. Trust my word. And in a world that, that, is, that, that, that has you know, so much you know, empty promises, it is good that we can trust in something that is unshakable as Jesus Christ. So the Bible describes Jesus as the rock, something that is stable and something that is firm, something that cannot be moved. And brothers and sisters, I behoove us to have our faith anchored in Jesus Christ. You know, when, when, when you have a boat, right? And you're on, you know, um, you, you're on a boat, they anchor, right? And they try to find what? They try to find something that is solid, something that is, that is durable for them to what? to anchor because they don't want to be moved and the same thing for us my friends if we have our faith if we have our faith anchored in Jesus Christ when the storm comes when the trials come we can stand fast and firm because we are anchored not in ourselves but in Jesus the boat doesn't move because the boat doesn't move not because the boat cannot be moved but the boat doesn't move because it is anchored in something that cannot be moved so we must be anchored in Jesus Isaiah describes Jesus as what? The rock of ages and the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 4. So Jesus is described as the rock. Clear enough? That's biblical. But my question is, so Jesus is the rock in a figurative sense. In, 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 in symbolic language, Jesus is the rock. My question is, God told Moses to hit the rock. If Jesus is a symbol of a rock, why smite the rock? Why hit the rock? What does this smiting of the rock represent? It's a good question, right? What the rock was smitten, what does this represent? Turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 53, verse starting at verse 1. What does this smiting of the rock represent? Isaiah chapter 53, beginning at verse 1. And it tells us, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This is Isaiah speaking prophetically, speaking about the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ the righteous. This is Isaiah speaking under the spirit of inspiration, under the spirit of prophecy, speaking and foretelling of Jesus who is to come. And speaking of Christ, he says, when we see him, he's not going to be all dazzling and beautiful. He's going to look like a regular man. And that is so true. When the soldiers came for Jesus, they didn't know which one because he was a regular man. Verse 3, speaking about Jesus, he is despised and what? Rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we, as it were, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Verse 4, and this is, this is the key, this is the key. This is going to help us understand what does this smiting represent. Verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him. What? What? Stricken, smitten of God. So here the Bible tells us that, this, that Jesus was smitten of God. When, when did that happen? At Calvary. At Calvary, smitten of God and what? Afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Verse 6 All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone his own way, and the Lord had laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So, this smiting of the rock that God tells Moses to do only but once represents Jesus 
dying on the cross of Calvary representing being him being sacrificed once and for all. But there was another occasion when Moses in rage hit the rock, but he hit the rock twice. And that was wrong for more reasons than one. One of the reasons is that it was wrong because God told him to speak to the rock and not hit the rock. Another reason why it was wrong, it was wrong because Jesus was not to be sacrificed twice. Only once. So God tells Moses, hit the rock and hit it once. Oh, brothers and sisters, we need to thank God for what, Jesus, what God has done. That he, and let's read verse 10, verse 10, what it says. Yet it, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to smite his son for us. God is saying, I love you so much that I will allow my son to go on the cross to die for you so that our relationship can be restored. Friends, if it wasn't for the cross, if it wasn't for the cross of Calvary, we, I mean, we would have no hope. You can imagine, for those students who are in school, you can imagine getting an A and still fail. That doesn't make no sense, eh? How could you get an A and still fail? Well, if Jesus was in there, even if we got an A, we still would fail. You say, I say, what do you mean? The law requires perfect obedience. From birth. Even if today we decide, God, we can follow you all the way, and we walk after everything God say perfectly, we get an A. God still can't accept that. So when we come and we pray in Jesus' name, that's not a willy-nilly thing. We cannot, it can't, we cannot come to God in any other way. And friends, sometimes we forget that Jesus is the only, is because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that we even could have a talk with God. Only because of what Jesus has done that we can even talk about heaven. So Jesus has done a lot for us. And as we look at this rock who was smitten for us, friends, we need to remember Jesus Christ who was smitten on the cross of Calvary, who endured sacrifice and pain and torture for me and you. And as I sat down on communion, when we had the communion, and, 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 and as you hold that bread, you recognize that God, his son, was actually broken for you. And the natural question is, Lord, you sacrificed all this for me. What have I sacrificed for you? You have done so much so that our relationship could work. But Lord, how much have I done so that our relationship could really work? What are you asking me to sacrifice and to give up that I am unwilling to do when you have done all of this for me? All we, are, all we like sheep, have gone astray. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Someone said, well, I like, I like Osama bin Laden. I like um, Saddam Hussein. I like uh, Adolf Hitler. And I like them. No, they was terrible. They was terrible. But friends, at the foot of the cross, it's a level plane. Level plane. Only two groups of people at the foot of the cross, you know. Two groups of people. The sinner and the savior. You are like him, like those criminals in substance, but different in degree, but you're still the same. All we like sheep have gone astray. And all of us in here, every last one, uneducated, educated, rich, poor, black, white, all of us in here, all of us on the globe, are in need of Jesus Christ. And we need to praise God and thank God for the salvation that is made available through the death of Jesus Christ. So friends, after seeing what God has done for us, the natural thing we could say, Lord, you've done a lot for me. You've done a lot. You've done a lot. 
You've done a lot to make our relationship work. You've, you, you have literally, you have literally became the bridge. Understand that? You remember the ladder? Who is the ladder? Jesus is the ladder. He literally became the bridge. So the relationship between God and man can be restored. And you upon seeing that say, Lord, you've done all that for me. I need to respond and I want to respond in loving obedience to you. And if that's your desire, would you kneel with me as we pray? Thanking God for what he has done through the smitten rock and asking him to give us power to do his will. Let us pray. Great attentive till I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter by my closer still to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart to take and seal it. Cards above. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the smitten rock. And Father, that rock was not smitten arbitrarily. No, no, no. That rock was not smitten haphazardly. That rock was smitten intentionally for us. It was a deliberate smite, a deliberate move for us. And Father, we thank you so much for what you have done for us in giving your Son to us. We thank you for his sacrifice. And we pray that you would help us, every last one of us in this congregation, that you may help us to be willing to make any sacrifice so that the relationship between you and us can be made right. Father, we know that we, like stiff-necked Israel, are stubborn and hard-hearted. But may you soften our hearts with your love. And in seeing what you have done for us, may you help us, Lord, to obey you. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us and what you are continuing to do. Continue to be with us, with us in this service, but most importantly, be in our hearts that we may live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I want to say a special happy Sabbath to our friends visiting with us this morning. And to the BABN family, you're always welcome. As we begin our song service this morning, we're going to begin with song number 341. Hymn number 341. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Amen? Amen. Amen. Great things he has done. If, he, if you don't see the great things he's doing in your life, then I say try him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. 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 To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Hymn number 341. Before we begin our song service, we're going to ask Brother Brivio to please open up in prayer. Brother Brivio. Amen. 
far as possible, as Reverend Neil before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Pass me not a gentle Savior Hear my humble cry While on others thou art calling Lord, do, do not pass me by Calling Savior, who oh, Savior, my Lord, hear a oh, humble, hear a humble cry. Why, while another thou art called, calling Lord, do, do not pass. Gracious, kind, loving Heavenly Father, we take time, Lord, to seek thy face. We want to give you the thanks and praise for another holy Sabbath day you allow us to see. We give you thanks and praise that we can sing that song, crying out, Savior, Savior, please hear our humble cry. Lord, we perish, we ask that you save us. Strengthen us in faith to know that, Lord, you truly cares for us and it's your will that none of us be lost. Help us all, Lord to make our calling election sure, even today on this year, Holy Sabbath day. We pray for our listeners out there in a special way, Father. May they be in power, Lord, to do your will as they understand truth. Give them the power to walk therein. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who have lost their loved ones. We pray for those who are here seeking truth. We know that they will not be disappointed. For your Holy Spirit is there to lead us and guide us into all truth. Help us, Lord, to say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way today. We ask that, Lord, you beat each person that is here present, even our visitors. Lord, as your spirit has allowed them to walk into these doors and help them, Lord, to be enlightened, to know of the future, not just to live for this world, Father, but there is a high cause for low living. Lord, each one have to give an account. We have, the Lord, a savior who can save to the utmost. It will just let go and let God. We ask that, Lord, you be with my brother Paul in a special way, Father, that your Holy Spirit will continue, Lord, to take control of his life. Be with his wife, be with his children. Help them all to walk, Lord, as children of light while they're in this world. Bless the message that you'll have, Lord, today. Put your words in his mouth once again. And, Lord, help us to take it in as you are speaking to us through him today. We give you thanks and praise that we can take time out to sing your praises. Even now, may you get the honor and glory, may we all be drawn. May self be put aside, that the Savior can show up and shine out in each heart. These blessings and favors we ask in faith, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. You know, in the book Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17, Christ is waiting. He's watching over us, just, just joy. See, watch over us with joy and singing. And he said that we must build him a sanctuary that he may dwell among us. So let's sing. Let's sing with joy and praise this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 He's here with us. I believe that. In the power of the Holy Spirit, he's here with us. So let's sing with joy and praise. Hymn number 341 once again. To God be the glory, great things he has done. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So love he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened a life he dared all men go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. 
praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Great things He has taught us, great things He has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but pure and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Amen, amen. Hymn number 83. Hymn number 83. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, oh, gratefully sing His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, Brilliant and in splendor and girded with praise. You know these authors, the authors of these songs must have been having an experience mm -hmm. when they pen these words. Amen. If you just read the words and put yourself in that aspect and see, you could have a, a vivid understanding of something that they were going through when they pen these words. These words wasn't penned just half-heartedly. It was an experience these people were going through. Hymn number 83, O oh, worship the King, all glorious above. O oh, worship the King, all glorious above. O oh, gratefully sing His wonderful love. The ancient of days, pavilion in splendor, and girded with praise. Oh, tell of his mind, oh, sing of his grace, who 